Hey guys, Tyler here. Firefly is a space western drama series created by Joss Whedon. Set in the year 2517, the show follows the renegade crew of Serenity, a Firefly-class spaceship. Of the nine characters who make up the ensemble cast, some of them fought on the losing side of a civil conflict called the Unification War against an entity called the Alliance. These former rebels and their comrades make a living on the fringes of society as part of their solar system's pioneer culture. So yeah, when I said space western, I really meant space western. Known for being prematurely canceled by the genius executives at the Fox Network, Firefly only ran for one season but has since gained a substantial cult following and spawned an entire media franchise. In this video, I'd like to dive into the background lore of Firefly, comparing it to our expectations about our own future. Let's get started. The most pertinent information regarding Firefly's general setting is revealed in an opening blurb at the beginning of each episode. In short, after the Earth was used up, humanity found a new solar system and terraformed and colonized hundreds of planets and moons. The central planets formed the Alliance, which is a fusion of the People's Republic of China and the United States of America the two dominant superpowers when the exodus from Earth occurred. The timeline of events surrounding all of this we'll get to in a minute. Sometime after the Alliance was formed, they waged the Unification War to bring all the other planets of the system under their rule. The war lasted for six years, and in the aftermath, both sides still harbor resentment. But the cultural consequences of the Alliance's formation are felt throughout the system. In this verse, humans have a very unique way of talking, mixing both English and Chinese phrases in their speech. Technically, Chinese viewers have said that the Mandarin spoken on the show is unintelligible, but hey, you know, some linguistic drift is to be expected over a span of 500 years, am I right? Beyond this broad background information, there's not a lot that we know about the details of Firefly's in-universe history. That is, at least from canon. There you go, this isn't even a Star Trek video and we're already getting into the weeds of canon versus non-canon. But seriously, despite the limited information that we get in the show, other reference sources have fleshed out more regarding the half-millennium beyond the present day. The Serenity role-playing game suggests that in 2020, astronomers discovered the star system 34 Tauri, confirming the existence of a planetary system seven years later. While this is normally where I'd say, of course, 34 34 Tauri is a real star system X number of light years away. In fact, 34 Tauri doesn't exist. Okay, actually, it does exist, but the more commonly known name for it is Uranus. This is because in 1690, when John Flamsteed first observed the planet, he initially recorded it as a star. It was only in the 1780s that it was commonly accepted to be a planet rather than a star or comet. Oh, so this is like a Neptunians from Futurama situation, right? Uh, no, for real, regardless of their name, the 34 Tauri star group in Firefly has an abundance of inhabited worlds, similar to the Helios star group in Battlestar Galactica. But before those worlds were inhabitable, they were, of course, barren rocks. Speaking of barren rocks, that's what the Earth became in the Firefly universe. Non-canon reference materials indicate that by 2030, it was determined that a 21st century standard of living would no longer be possible on Earth within a hundred years. In the 2040s, efforts to terraform Venus and Mars were underway with some early success, but these efforts were abandoned due to lack of natural resources. Global morale on Earth hit an all-time low, and riots broke out in major cities. An early precursor of the Alliance was formed to seize control of Earth's remaining resources and institutions, with 98% of Earth's nations yielding sovereignty to the organization by 2060. However, unlike in the Expanse, where countries yield sovereignty to the United Nations to combat climate change, in Firefly, it was determined that saving Earth was a lost cause. Rather, the plan was to leave. 
Earth's cities were literally dismantled to construct massive generation ships called arcs, with samples of plant and animal life collected over a span of decades. During the back half of the 21st century, the human population dropped by a billion due to starvation, disease, pollution, and crime. By 2094, boarding of the arcs began, a process which itself took years. The Proto-Alliance declared martial law, and a rich black market formed around selling positions in the boarding lottery. The first Ark ships departed Earth in 2097, with the whole fleet departed by 2101, their destination 40 light years away. By 2200, robotic terraformers arrived in the 34 Tauri system and began terraforming the core planets of Sinone and Londinium the respective colony worlds of Asia and the West. The first arcs arrived 20 years later. During the journey, the old ethnic and political barriers began to blur, and over generations, people became fluent in both English and Mandarin. Sinon, Londinium, and the other core worlds around the White Sun, Bai He, became home to some of the most advanced cultures in the verse. And as Joss Whedon wrote in a production memo published in a visual companion book to the 2005 Serenity feature film, advanced was right. These were enlightened cultures with tolerance for non-aggressive religious beliefs, the dominant religion being Buddhism, though other faiths persist as well. Literacy rates were at 94%, the average lifespan was 120 years, and non-mandatory public service was ingrained into people's ethos. As we see in the show, people's social mores have also evolved beyond our modern standards. For instance, sex work is legalized and federally regulated, with companion houses set up on several planets. Only women are allowed to run such houses. No companion can be coerced to take a client, they're trained in all the arts, and they often rise to social or political prominence upon retirement. It sounds like a sorry matriarchs. While there are still those like Captain Malcolm Reynolds who voice judgment about the companion profession, calling them whores, Inara Sarah, who operates a shuttle that docks with Serenity, is referred to on multiple occasions as the ship's ambassador. But for all the cultural and technological advancement that has taken place on the core worlds, on the outer planets, life is rougher and tougher, and not always in a fun way. People on these worlds don't have access to the most advanced technologies and are plagued by extreme poverty, crime, disease, famine, religious extremism, and more, aka many of the same societal ills that plagued Earth in the 21st century. Life for everyone on the central planets isn't all peachy either. Many are still stuck in dead-end jobs, and while they rarely want for food or shelter, they have the keen, watchful eye of the Alliance monitoring them all their lives. The parallels with our modern-day society are intentional. In Joss Whedon's vision of the future, besides technology, nothing has fundamentally changed about humanity. It's a very specific kind of dystopian future, one whose general attributes are echoed in various other modern sci-fi media. Also paralleling the imperial decline of our modern world, by the early 26th century, humanity yet again faces overpopulation and resource shortages, which is what prompts the Alliance to declare war on the outer planets for control. We also don't get a lot of specific information about the course of the Unification War besides the names of a few battles and identity of some vets, such as Reynolds and his first officer on Serenity, Zoe Aline, among others. Thus picks up the original pilot of Firefly, Serenity, which brings the crew together and naturally introduces many elements of the Firefly universe. A lithograph created by our boy Jeffrey Mandel, author and illustrator of Star Trek Star Charts, depicts the worlds of the 34 Tauri system in more detail. Upon its discovery in 2020, it was determined that the system consisted of five stars. The primary white sun, or Bai He, which I've already mentioned, Georgia, or Huang Long, Red Sun, or Zhu Ke, Kalidasa, or San Wu, and Blue Sun, or Qing Ling. The A class Bai He is larger and hotter than our sun, and its Chinese name means White Tiger of the West. 
In addition to Sinon, Londinium, and an assortment of gas giants, Baihu is orbited by 12 other terrestrial planets and 26 terrestrial moons with a population of 39 billion that make up the core worlds. Interestingly, Sinon and Londinium happen to be in a Trojan orbit with each other. Additionally, two brown dwarfs orbiting Baihu have been helioformed using nanotechnology to make them into artificial protostars called Qin Shi Huang and Lux. The Georges system consists of the G class star Huang Long, or the Yellow Dragon of the Center, and an assortment of dozens of planets and moons on the border that make up the former independent planets those who rebelled against the Alliance, with a population of 3 billion. It's also accompanied by a protostar named Murphy, and shares an orbit at Baihu's L3 point with Zhu Ke, or the Red Phoenix of the South. Zhu Ke is a G-class star slightly smaller than our Sun, and the Red Sun System, which is Alliance-affiliated, consists of dozens of planets and moons with a population of 3.5 billion, as well as protostars called Himmenbjörg and Heinlein. San Wu, or the Black Tortoise of the North, is an F-class star on the rim of the 34 Tauri system with a population just under 1 billion, and a protostar called Pinglai. And Ching Long, or the Blue Dragon of the East, is an F-class star in the rim with a population of 18 million and a protostar called Burnham. It's in the Blue Sun system that the first attack by the Reavers Ah yes, Reapers! No, Reavers was recorded. This group of cannibal pirates are apparently the result of Alliance chemical experimentation on Miranda, the outermost inhabited planet of 34 Tauri. As I've hinted at, the technological divide in Firefly makes for a very distinct setting. Many planets and moons are presented as literal realizations of the frontier town aesthetic and mythos. But this divide has deadly consequences. The Alliance, the core planets, have something of a monopoly on the legal possession of the most advanced technologies, such as a powerful laser pistol called the Lassiter, literally named after John Lassiter, a longtime friend and collaborator of Joss Whedon's. Alliance medical technology is also leaps and bounds beyond what's available in the outer planets, with one one clear example being the experimentation on River Tam to harness her psychic powers. By the way, if we'd gotten more seasons of Firefly, maybe we would have gotten more information about the nature of these psychic powers. As far as spaceships, Serenity distinctly lacks weapons. When push comes to shove, all the ship has to get her out of trouble is her crew's ingenuity. Serenity is a Series 3 Firefly-class transport vessel, which by the time of the show is one generation out of date. Named after the Battle of Serenity Valley in the Unification War, Serenity, like other Firefly Series 3s, is equipped with VTOL engines that allow for tight turns and a trace compression block engine, more reliable than the lower quality Gerstler engine used in many Alliance vessels. In addition to these features, Serenity and other spaceships depicted in Firefly have artificial gravity, inertial dampeners, or at least an equivalent of such thing, and lots of other technologies we commonly associate with far future spaceships. But interestingly, Firefly makes a choice not to include faster than light travel even 500 years down the line. This is not terribly unusual for sci-fi, as many universes present a future where humanity does not have the luxury of FTL to address our resource problems. But when I said Firefly presents a very specific dystopia, here's what I meant. Firefly gets a lot right. We are using up the Earth. Over the past few years in particular, we have crossed a number of dire thresholds relating to our ability to combat climate change. 2016 marked the first time that our net annual carbon dioxide emissions surpassed 400 parts per million, which according to scientists has basically guaranteed that the global average temperature will continue to rise over the next several decades. How many degrees is still to be determined determined, since that depends on policy choices by polluting countries. Either way, this temperature rise will be accompanied not just by rising sea levels, but more extreme weather events, resource shortages, and an exacerbated migration crisis, among other things. By 2030, if many of the climate goals of the 2015 Paris Accords are not met, which we're closer to doing than you might think, 
then the situation will continue to worsen even further. I don't know about you, but the threat of not being able to sustain our current standard of living much longer doesn't just sound like a distinct possibility. It feels like a certainty. And yet, if we ever had to leave Earth, as I'm about to explain, we're kind of fucked. You see, various research papers have concluded that, under realistic scenarios that account for the annual increase in our planet's energy capacity, it will take another 200 years for us to develop a spacecraft that can achieve interstellar travel in a human lifetime. Furthermore, it will take until the late 25th century, mere decades before Firefly is set, to harness enough energy to decelerate a spacecraft, be it a probe or colony ship, to reach a nearby solar system. Now, these numbers are purely theoretical, and a more optimistic scenario does place the construction of a colony ship running on kinetic energy alone at about 2100. But even this optimistic estimate flies in the face of more optimistic futures like Star Trek that have us achieving FTL this century. But it's the reason I find it realistic that in The Expanse, for instance, we're just on the cusp of interstellar travel, two, even three centuries from now. So humanity organizing a mass exodus of Earth by 2100 only if we ramp up our energy production significantly. Which does track with the lore of Firefly, but that's in response to a determination that Earth is beyond saving. The setting, a vision of the Wild West in space with all the problems of 21st century Earth, is frankly the best case scenario we could imagine if we continue on our present course. And realistically, if we continued on our present course, we're marching closer and closer to extinction than being able to start over in another star system. And in the show, the persistence of poverty, disease, famine, religious zealotry, and authoritarian governance offers yet another example of a path we should avoid. One of the things I like about Firefly, in addition to its memorable characters, witty dialogue, and other smart writing, is its world building. I'm a sucker for interesting world building, because it helps sell that the setting of a sci-fi story is lived in, so to speak. So what's your favorite aspect of Firefly? And a controversial question that I nonetheless want to ask, do you agree with the common consensus that Firefly was canceled too early? Let me know down below. With that, Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. I just want to give a quick shout out to all of my donors who allow me to bring on talent like editors to help deliver more high quality content for you to enjoy. Also, by becoming a patron or member, you get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name of the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation, all are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description too. That's all I have for this week. I'll see you next time.